That was the first time I've ever started the recording. Really? Yeah, I feel I feel seduced. You feel super important. Yeah, I feel slick with the power. Power is just yeah. <laughs> emanating. <laughs> today, today I was driving to work, and it's President's Day when we're recording this, and someone in Utah has the job of making sassy road signs. Oh, don't president your car. Did yeah, you see that? Don't one? president your car. And I was like. Which absolute buffoon over at the Utah <laughs> Department of Transportation was like, guys, guys. Yeah. Guys, check this out. Look what I've done. Normally I find them quite amusing, but that yeah. one was like. That one was a little too much for that me That one too. was a little much. Some of them are really It was funny, a bit of a reach. But that one I was driving, and it took me forever because I saw something about president. And I was like, Jesus Christ, what are they saying about Donald Trump on my freeway commute? And then I was like, oh. What if it was like oh. the president is dead? I would have been delighted. I know. I was just like, imagine if they advertised that on. <laughs> UDOT was like, breaking news! Breaking news. President is dead. <laughs> the president is missing. <laughs> the president is missing. Do you know my little sister loves the movie? The show Designated Survivor? That. How depressing like is that? Sutherland. How depressing is that? And that's pretty terrible taste. <sighs> she can't help it. Okay. Um... Does that count as an intro? Did we do enough? Did we do enough introduction? I guess. I mean, I could keep saying nonsense <laughs> indefinitely. Yeah, me too. Well, this is everybody hates Rand. Your friendly neighborhood wheel of time podcast. <laughs> I'm Emily Jushaw. I'm Sally Goodger. Uh, spoiler alert. Also, um, your feelings about Rand are irrelevant. Don't DM us. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> We are back at it with Parent. I feel like that's why I started last time. Yeah, it's because we've been here for years. I know. I feel like I'll, I've lived here. I'm going to die here. Yeah. Here in Parent land. What a horrible land. I know. What would Parent land look like? Like. It's just billboards of fail and animatronic wolves. Yeah. <laughs> what a horrible place to be. I know. <laughs> Wolves and fail. And fail just everywhere. And like axes and hammers. You have to every time, every time you come to a fork in the road, you have to choose an axe or a hammer, and that yeah. will inform. It's like choose your own adventure. Yeah, that and will inform. The like photo ops are all like inside a blacksmith shop. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you watch someone do some blacksmithing. Maybe you learn how to do some blacksmithing. Mm-hmm. That would actually be pretty cool. But maybe you learn blacksmithing. Maybe it's like a fancy blacksmith college, where everyone looks. Like fail or gall. What would the um? What would the mascot of Blacksmith College be? Blacksmith College. Would I, I the, fighting say <laughs> the fighting anvils. The fighting anvils. I'm gonna die. Go fighting anvils. <laughs> Go. Wow. God, I wish I ran the school newspaper at the Blacksmith College. What would you write about? What would I write about? All the yeah. blacksmithing that yeah, was but like, going what, on. Like, would there be like an arts and entertainment section? Would there I guess be a there'd sport have to section? Be. Yeah, it would all just be different variations <laughs> of blacksmithing. It's like the art of blacksmithing, the yeah. competition aspect of blacksmithing, blacksmith scandals. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much how it felt at the <laughs> University of Utah school newspaper. We were just manufacturing news constantly out of yeah. thin air. It was like, nothing's really happening here. Yeah, it's a pretty boring campus all it's around. It's an incredibly boring campus. Because you're like, oh, look, more shitty white people doing shitty things. Yeah. Anyway, so we are arriving at Blacksmith College, a.k.a. Jara. Jara. Or do you think it's Yara? I think that is to, um, <laughs> what's the opposite of Eurocentric? Anyway, I think it's too opposite of Eurocentric a pronunciation for Robert Jordan, who you're right. is so Eurocentric, it's ridiculous. Jara. Jara, Jara sounds like... I don't know, a Star Wars villain. Like Jar Jar Banks, Jar Jar Banks. Right. Jar Jar Banks. <laughs> Jar Jar Banksy. <laughs> oh, God. Banksy? I think it's Banksy. Banksy, you're right. I'm mixing up my consonants. Banksy? Who's the Banksy of Wheel of Time world? Probably Tom, let's be honest. Tom came yeah. to Kings, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're rolling to this little town, <laughs> which has a few. Um, <laughs> a few characteristics that Perrin immediately notices. One, it smells funny. Yeah. Two, there's like, what is it? They're just like rubble. Yeah, like, there's like detritus everywhere. Detritus everywhere. <laughs> and Perrin's just like, what the fuck? What the f- hap is fucking What the hap? This is the bad place. This is the bad place. <laughs> and they, um, 
Yeah, especially when they get there and they're like, it's been weddings nonstop. That is my personal bad place. Yeah, that's just Utah, though. Yeah, it is. This is the bad place. This is the bad place. It's like a baby gap. (laughs) (laughs) Also smells funny and just so many children. What? I was in a gap today. You were? That's where I bought these overalls. Those are good overalls. I didn't know they were new. Thank you. They're brand new today. Yes. Yes. They're cute. Thanks. Um... <clears throat> anyway, they go to this inn and are greeted by this fellow who Perrin immediately describes as looking like a frog. Yeah, because he got no chin. Because he's got no chin or something. And I'm like, okay, Perrin, a little judgy. Yeah, a little, a little fucking judgmental. A little judgy up in here. What do you look like? You have yellow eyes. Fool. Your nickname is Young Bull. Yeah, so we can't, let's, he who throws the first stone. Yeah. <laughs> Calm down. Stones throw away from hell, my dude. Um... And this guy's like, oh, yeah, sorry. Well, first he's like, oh, yellow eyes boy. And then he's like, whoa, I said I. And then he's like, whoa, what's that? What's that? And Loyal's like, I'm an oak eater. And he's like, okay, I'm a little racist. But he's like, what is he? <laughs> what yeah, is no, that? He asks my rain too. He's like, excuse me, what is this? I literally wrote in the book. I was like, this is racism. Mm-hmm. Stop it. Um, Simeon? Is that a Simeon. 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 Simonian? Simone? Samoa. Samoa. The cookie? It's Girl Scout cookie season, guys. Oh, it is? February? Yeah. Okay. I have yet to see a Girl Scout. I haven't seen a Girl Scout in about ten years. Yeah. I just really want some Thin Mints. Okay. I'll just see what I can do, I guess. So, parents like, hey, what the shit, balls? Hey, Hey. what's what's all this confetti scattered around? And Simeon's like, what's all, why is everyone covered in glitter? And Simeon sneezes and glitter comes out. Yeah. He's like, we've we've been having weddings for the last two days nonstop. And everyone's like, okay, that's super weird. (laughs) Super weird. But uh, I guess everyone's literally just like falling asleep. Simeon has to be like, stable boys come here. And they just like roll out of the stable, sleepwalking. Exhausted. They walk into the inn and the innkeeper's literally asleep at the bar. (laughs) And I'm like, first of all, this is a big mood. Yeah. This is me at 7 a.m. in my workplace. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, then Simeon is like, here are your rooms, and um, they go up to their rooms. Can't really remember. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and then Perrin, of course, is, like, asking Simeon about Rand. Yeah, Perrin, like, starts to ask Simeon about Rand, and Loyal, not Loyal, uh, Lane, like, you know, <laughs> like, draws his thumb across his, his thumb neck. across his throat, He's and like, it's like, shut, shut up. up, Perrin. He's like, stop it. And Perrin is like, mm, that's rude, and doesn't take the hint. Yeah. And is like, hey, Simeon, so have you seen a, a tall dude rolling through here? And Simeon's like, oh, yeah, he was here. He was playing the flute. <laughs> At a bunch of the weddings. At a bunch of the weddings. And it's like, Rand, what the fuck? Okay, imagine, like... Yeah, why don't I get that scene? I know. Rand rolling out of the forest, shirt probably untucked and unbuttoned. No, like, buttoned wrong. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Some <laughs> plays the stupid. flute at a bunch of weddings. He's literally the Pied Piper of weddings. You're right. In this situation. And yeah, he does have this very, like, weird Pied Piper move across the country. Yeah. Where he's just, like, uh, he's leaving this, like, trail of weddings and funerals behind him. Yeah. It's really upsetting. It's very weird. But I do really want to see, like, Dirty Forest Rand playing the flute. I know, and everyone's just like, um, well, this dude's over here in the corner literally muttering to himself. He's yeah. kind of dirty. He can't button his own shirt. But we do need an accompanist for the wedding. <laughs> we do need a flautist. <laughs> we do need a flautist. Excuse me, good sir. Can you play Mozart? <laughs> And Rand's like, of course. Rand's like, yes, I learned from the best. And then he oh. makes something up. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all like, oh. <laughs> That's what he learned from Matt. <laughs> Improvisation. Matt would be a good improv. Oh, imagine if this was still Rand and Matt, because then you'd have Rand accompanying weddings and Matt juggling at weddings. I would want someone to juggle at my wedding. I know, that'd be kind of funny. I mean, wouldn't that be funny? You're like, and here's the entertainment. Instead of a playlist, it's this guy juggling. <laughs> kind of hilarious. Yeah, instead of like a wedding video, yeah. like pictures of us as children, it's this dude in the corner juggling. Yeah. Delightedly. <laughs> Just like, hey, here Why we go. Why the fuck am I here? <laughs> I feel like, damn, now I want to have a wedding. I've never really felt the desire to get married before, but I'll find you a juggler. Thank you. <laughs> you can get married to the juggler. No. <laughs> I couldn't marry a juggler. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's that's their profession. They just also happen to juggle. Okay, yeah. They if can it's be like, like a juggling surgeon. Okay, if it's like juggling as a hobby, that's okay for me for <laughs> some reason. <laughs> just like juggling as a career, it's like. <laughs> Is upsetting. that even a career? Exactly. <laughs> no, 
but I mean, like, can someone genuinely like, make money off of being able to jump? Mm-hmm. I did for like okay, <laughs> but this weeks. is obviously we don't live in real world. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. We anyway, and then Simeon's like, "Yeah, we saw that guy. He was kind of creepy, and kept talking about how people were trying to kill him." And then there's this moment of silence, and Loyal's like, "We're not trying to kill him." <laughs> Loyal's like, where are his friends? Obviously. And Simeon's like, another long pause. And then is like, sure. <laughs> I'm sure I believe you. You know, this whole chapter is just like, is so zany. I know. It's like peak comedy it's up really in here. Funny. It's just hilarious because especially because it's happening to Perrin. Yeah. Who's <laughs> incapable of coping with anything. I know. Like if I rolled into a town that there was just like covered in confetti and condoms and whatever yeah. happened, oh God, like gross. <laughs> okay, not used to condoms. You're right. I misspoke. But it was just like covered in confetti and like old wedding flowers and everyone's sleeping. I'd be like, this is the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. I know. I'd life. be like, what the hell? Yeah. But parents just like, this is stupid. Parents just like rolls on through untouchable so stoic I no know. sense of humor that he's boy. just literally like the round rock from indiana jones <laughs> rolling through the countryside literally nothing affects him he just crushes everything in his path <laughs> it's so boring <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> angry villagers are like throwing things at him but he's a big ass rock <laughs> nothing can go <laughs> nothing bothers him and he's following in the path of bigger rock randall thor yeah Exactly. Um, What's a bigger rock than the one in Indiana Jones? <laughs> what like, other famous boulders do we that's have? That's the biggest famous boulder, I feel. <laughs> the only perfectly spherical boulder capable of rolling. No. Okay, we can't talk about this. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Perrin, then Simeon is like, hey, can your friend heal my sick brother? And Perrin's like, Again, long silence. What are you talking about? <laughs> Simeon's like, well, she's like, and I said I, right? And the parents like, I have to go talk to my <laughs> He's Like real leaves. subtle. Loyal's like, meanwhile, let's talk about trees because he's a good boy. Yeah, then Perrin goes to Moiraine's room and is like, hey, that dipshit did see Rand. Yeah. And Moiraine's like, could you please not fuck up everything that I, <laughs> that you touch for once in your life? She's like, I hate you. Yeah. You're the worst. And he's like, okay, I don't care. Also. <laughs> also, he knows you're an nice guy and wants you to heal his brother. And, and Maureen's like, like, you made this worse somehow. Maureen's like, oh my god. Oh, there's like an iconic moment where Maureen and Lan have an eye conversation, yeah. you know? And yeah. she's like, no. And Perrin's like, did he just <laughs> silently ask you if he should kill that man? <laughs> And everyone's like, it's fine to worry about it. And Perrin's like, I'm worried about it. I'm pretty worried about it. I'm pretty it. worried about it. We're just going to kill any, like, what? This would be a much more hilarious story if Moiraine was just killing inconvenient people constantly. I know, it would be so funny. <laughs> like, it would be sad, obviously. No, it would horrible. actually, you know what's actually really funny is that probably Lan has gone back and killed inconvenient people. Yeah. I just really like the idea of Eye of the World and then there's like an occasional splice over to Lan's point of view. And he's just like, you are so annoying. He's just like killing someone who Matt annoyed. You know? (laughs) He's like, this guy's definitely gonna tell the dark friends about Matt. He's gonna be like, listen to this asshole story. Gotta do a murder. (laughs) Um, but Moiraine's like, fine, I'll go heal whoever's brother-in-law. This rando's brother. Whatever. Um, and... So they go down to the, like, the stable or something, or, like, a shed. I know, and how would you not be immediately like, oh, this boy's trying to kill me. I know, they're like, um, excuse me? And, yeah, of course Perrin ends up going, because, you know. Before this, they also find out that, like, the White Cloaks were, went through this town. And, And, like, like, completely lost it. Yeah. And just, like, yeah. Some of them ditched, like, completely abandoned the cause. Some of them tried to, like, make passes at women. Yeah. Some of them went crazy and tried to kill some people. And just, like, were trying to, like, burn down the yeah. inn. Yeah, and everyone else was, like, all the other white cloaks were, like, what? What's happening? And they just, like, tied them up and left. Yeah. That's the one white cloak point of view that I want to see. I know. The dude who's okay, tied up his you... two best friends and is, like, I don't, what? why is my date like this? Could you imagine if it was, like, when Galad had joined the white cloaks oh and Galad's just, like, 
was going on. Glad walks into a town. There's millions of weddings. Everyone wants to marry him immediately. Yeah, obviously. Obviously. All of his white cloak friends are just, like, trying to burn down random buildings. Yeah, and Galad's like, um, excuse me? Beg pardon? Beg, I, can we get through one day when, where we don't do this, <laughs> my guys? <laughs> guys, one day. Again? <laughs> Freaking again? <laughs> Come on, Jeremy. Jeremy. <laughs> we can't keep doing this. Jeremy the White Cloak. We cannot keep doing this. Jeremy, you're already wanted in 16 countries for arson. <laughs> There's only like 12 countries. Exactly. <laughs> okay, anyways. Jeremy, Jeremy the White Sean Cloak. Shen- <laughs> Jeremy what? Jeremy Shonshin. <laughs> he started in Shonshin and he made his way over. Oh, Yeah. That's how he got all those countries. Yeah, he's going for the, uh... He's going for the (laughs) arson world record. (laughs) The Guinness Book of World Records for how many arson (laughs) charges he can get. Isn't there, like, a phrase for, like, for, like, when you win all of the competitions? Like, I don't know. (laughs) What? (laughs) What are you talking about? What competition? I don't know. (laughs) It's sports. (laughs) <laughs> the only thing I can think of right now is the EGOT. <laughs> Jeremy, you've got the EGOT in arson. <laughs> God, where's the buddy cop of Jeremy the White Cloak and Larry the Troll? <laughs> oh my gosh, we're so good at making Wheel of Time characters. So Jeremy the White Cloak and Larry the Troll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeremy, you fucking pyromaniac lunatic. I love him. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Simeon's like, here's my brother. <coughs> nice to meet you. His name's Noam. Gnome. Gnome? Is it Gnome or like Noam? I have no idea. I really Literally, it, it has never gnome. occurred to me to pronounce this name aloud before. But like, you know, Gnome like garden gnome. Yeah, yeah, of course I know. Did you know my little brother collected garden gnomes for... Adam is a several years. fascinating creature. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely <laughs> use those words on that. <laughs> Just like everything you tell me about him makes him more and more complex. <laughs> layers upon layers. It's like an onion. Of weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh... Does this mean he just had, like, a closet full of garden gnomes? They were, like, all on his shelves. I mean, it got kind of out of hand, because I have an aunt who, um, I have several extended family members who are, like, once they find out that we like one thing, or that we're, quote-unquote, collecting something, (coughs) that's, like, all they buy us for six years. Yeah. So I think Adam, likes garden gnome phase extended way past when he wanted it. Like, he was a little kid and liked garden gnomes, and then he's 13 and still getting garden gnomes. Oh, no. That's the worst. This happened to me with boxes. When I was a really little kid, I liked collecting, like, little decorative boxes. Because, mm-hmm. I don't know, I liked having things to open and shut or some yeah, shit. Yeah, you know, tactile. And I'm, like, 14, and people are still, like, here are these boxes. And I'm, like, I don't want this. But you give me a book. It's a box. I don't have anything to put in it. I don't have that many trinkets. My secrets. I have no secrets. I don't really. can't think of any. <laughs> I can't believe, I mean, you've never told me about the garden gnomes before. That wasn't a secret, it just didn't occur to me. I love garden gnomes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sally gives a garden gnome as a housewarming gift whenever mm-hmm. we go anywhere. I just think they're pleasant. Very, yeah, they are pleasant. I think it weirds people out. But... No, I think it's nice. Remember when you got my sister a garden gnome? Yeah, for her wedding? Yeah, I think she broke it. She did. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's fine, Sarah. Nah. <laughs> anyway... Garden gnome is locked in a stable. Yeah, garden gnome is literally locked in a shed, and he's just like feral. His yeah. shirt and pants are in tatters. He's like yeah. behaving like a wolf, like a wolf. <clears throat> and everyone's like, "Well, this is troubling." And Perrin's like, "Fuck me, running!" Yeah. Perrin's like, "Oh no, he has yellow eyes. He's me. Oh. I'm having an existential crisis. I'm being confronted with a mirror, which is a classic trope in a hero's journey, mm-hmm. by the way." Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and Moiraine's like, excuse me, while I enter this dangerous situation unaided. And she goes and, is, like, tries to heal Noam or something. And then comes back and is like, well, sorry, like, he's gone. Yeah. There's, there's nothing left of him. And Simeon's like, okay, well, thanks for trying. I know you would have helped. And then Moiraine pieces out. And <clears throat> Perrin's like, um, I don't mean to, like, get into your family business, but I feel like it would be best if you let your brother roam through the wild free rather than be locked here in this particular dank shed that probably has mold. Um, and Simeon's like, yeah, you're right. 
and lets his brother free into the wild. And he's like, by the way, well, I just thought maybe you could help because the White Cloaks were looking for a dark friend named Perrin Ibarra who has yellow eyes and, like, looks at Perrin significantly. And Perrin's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry for calling you a toad in my head. <laughs> or whatever I did. <laughs> so means like, we it's, thought you was a toad. We thought you was a toad. Okay. Do not seek the treasure. Don't see the treasure, parrot. Yeah. The treasure was inside you all along. Anyway, Simeon, stand-up guy, it turns out. Yeah. Which we all would except he was a little racist at the beginning, but, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> um, fantasy racist. Fantasy racism. Uh, still as bad as racism. Mm-hmm. All racism is bad. Okay. But yeah, Perrin is like, do you think Perrin Ibarra is a dark friend? And Simeon's like, I don't think Perrin Ibarra, the Sim- dark friend, <laughs> would have let my brother go free yeah. in this hypothetical situation. <laughs> and Perrin's like, cool, dude. <laughs> we cool. We cool. Peace out. And then he goes and has a panic attack. Yeah, and then he's like, will you bring food up to my room so that I don't have to look at anybody else with my yellow eyes? And yeah. Simeon's like, sure, dog. Yeah. Yeah. And then he defs goes and has a panic attack. Yeah, he's just, like, having a full-on panic attack. And then he's like, my rain? What do you know about wolves? <laughs> no, my rain. And he walks in, and she's, like, balancing a vial of ink on her knee. I know, which is, like, and I'm like, wow. Like, do I dare disturb the universe? Damn. Like, what if you spilled that all over your pretty blue dress? Exactly. She's just, like, she's, like, she's a queen. You know, she's so cool. Anyway, she's like, well, I've been waiting for you to come talk to me about this. And Perrin's like, yeah, I'm here. And she's like, I didn't bring it up because clearly you didn't want to talk about it. And I'm like, good for you, Moiraine. Good mentorship. Mm -hmm. Don't meddle. For once. For once. Yeah. (laughs) You're one example of good mentorship. She's pretty good with Matt, too. You know, she leaves him alone. It's like she gives up really early on. She's like, I don't know what to do with this. She's like, I'll try and... In book three, book four, which I was reading over because we were doing one of those books for or graffitied Wheel of Time books, and she has this whole thing about how, like, Matt is just, like, impossible to tail. Yeah. She just, like, sends out her spies, yeah. and Matt just, like, disappears. It's so She's funny. like, it's so infuriating. Um, I don't, gen- I generally don't like book four, but that, like, opening sequence where there's so much oh, yeah, it's here, so good. and it's just, like, Matt doing increasingly hilarious things, where parents like, I haven't seen Matt, he's just, like, down gambling. Yeah. And everyone's like, Matt? Matt who? M- Matt. Where is Matt? And Matt's like, Making out with someone or gambling you know, or constantly. playing strip poker, basically. Yeah, with the maidens of the city. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Which the he's fuck. like, that was hilarious. He's so weird. I love Matt. But yeah, where's <clears throat> Matt? Anyway, Perrin's like, what do you know about the whole wolf thing? And Moiraine's like, basically nothing, just that it's like been a thing for a yeah. long time. And I have no idea, like, sounds like what happened to Noam could happen to you. No idea what the chances are. Yeah. Perrin's like, great, that's deeply reassuring. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. And she's like, also, it's connected to dreams. So just like, just like, that's another fun thing for you to worry about, you know? Yeah, your dreams. Like, you need to sleep, but, you know, just remember. Wink. 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 Panic in your dreams. Yeah. Just don't die. Well, in it's interesting, dreams. too, that she doesn't say, she doesn't name it. She doesn't say, like, tell her on Re- Riyadh. I know, it's so weird. I feel like. Did, has Teleron Riyadh even been named yet in the context of the series? I don't think so. Yeah, I think this is when we get to Edwin's point of view. We're going to hop over to Edwin, and she, like, is introduced to the idea of Teleron Riyadh. Yeah. Because so far people have been like, oh, you're a dreamer. And that's just been like, when I have dreams, they might mean something. Yeah. But now it's like, here's a ring. Here's a magic ring that'll take you into the world of dreams. Yeah. And just go for it, you know? It's so weird. I know. And so it's really strange to me that Moiraine doesn't know anything about it even just like sort of tangentially yeah and it's hard to say with moiraine if she doesn't if she does know something about it and is like withholding the information because she doesn't want to like complicate things or whatever bullshit reasons she has for not sharing information or if she just like genuinely it's not her area of study Mm -hmm. it's just like teller on rian becomes so big in the series that like it it's hard to like understand that it's one of these things that lost knowledge. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, weird. everyone still knows about traveling. Everyone knows what traveling is. Yeah. And then traveling's introduced, and we're like, sweet, we've got teleporting back again. Nice. But with Teller on Rio, it's like, oh, well, and here we are again. Yeah. No one knows what the fuck this is, except for the ale. Nice. Because they're goals. 
What a bunch of weirdos. Yeah. Anyway, Perrin then does go to sleep and has some creepy dreams. I think there's one with Lanfear. Yeah, Lanfear's like, what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah, and there's one where he's, like, running around and Hopper's there. Yeah, and there's some, like, creepy dude who's like, I can't believe there's a peasant in my dream. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perrin, like, witnesses, like, when within the context of Teleron Riyadh, which we'll soon have, it's like Perrin sees a dude who's just normal and just, like, you know, kind of stumbled into Teleron Riyadh in his actual dream. Mm-hmm. And then, like, got attacked by a nightmare. Which is, like, a really cool aspect of Teleron Riyadh, by the way. Yeah. Not, like, cool. Like, it's creepy. It's deeply disturbing. But, like, the idea that you have to fight off nightmares mm-hmm. in the dream world. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and, like, Hopper just, like, pushes him out of Teleron Riyadh. He's like, you're not fucking ready because you're stupid. Yeah. And he, like, bites him. He's like, Rrr. Yeah. And then Perrin wakes up. And his clothes are all covered in blood and it's emo and whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's just, like... It's all a very, like, important sequence to Perrin. Yeah. Like, this informs so much of Perrin's, um, I don't know, it's a little weird. I wish Perrin hadn't been so, like, I wish this changed Perrin's mindset in a significant way, rather than just kind of, like, enforcing it. Yeah. Because up until this point, Perrin's just, like, been so kind of freaked out and afraid and really worried that this is going to turn out terribly. And now, great, here's an example of that turning out horribly from his perspective. Yeah. Um, and it's, like, it would have been kind of cool if, like, throughout book two, he kind of, like, started regarding this as, like, a neat superpower and, like, really accepting it and coming into it. Mm-hmm. And being, like, okay, this is cool. And then, like, book three hits and he's, like, oh, God. You know, just, like, it would have been a little a bit more interesting to read. Yeah. It's just kind of exhausting that we're two books and some change in and Perrin just can't, like, get over himself. Yeah. And he just, like doesn't yeah and he just like refuses to i think because it's especially frustrating because you have rand the most insufferable character of all time who is like attempting to come to terms with something yeah even when he's like in a lot of psychological duress he is at the core of it like attempting to understand and Perrin just is like no yeah it's weird between the three of them because matt just like insta comes to terms with it yeah Matt has his weird like luck night yeah <laughs> <laughs> Are you so excited to talk about that? Yeah, I am so excited. He has his, like, weird Vegas night on the strip and just comes away from that and is like, cool, guess I can manipulate luck. Yeah. And it's just like, great, I'm going to exploit this mercilessly. Mm-hmm. Which he does throughout, like, <laughs> like, he's found his superpower and he owns it. Yeah. You know, it's just, like, one of those, I mean, of course Matt spends forever trying to run away, too, but it's, like, again, it's so, I don't, I, it's hard for me to define how it's different than what Perrin yeah. does. Parents yeah. like push back versus maps just like perpetually fleeing. Yeah, it's again it's just like more built into Matt's character. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. I need to think more about it too, because it's hard for me to just be like, yes, it's different with Matt. Parents just like such a solid dude and he's introduced that way. Yeah. That you kinda want him to just like you want him to be like the one character who's not reacting to things with the level of like horror and panic that Rand is coming out yeah. with things. And, you know, Matt's kind of this, like, perpetually just, like, fluttering with anxiety. He's and got a lot Self-survivalism, of... you know? Yeah. But, yeah, and... yeah you just kind of want, like, Perrin to be like, okay, and, like, take things as they come. Yeah, we're introduced to Perrin as, like, the steady kind of, not even just, like, the steady guy, but, like, the stand-up team. Yeah. Like, he's supposed to be our, like, genuinely good person. Mm-hmm. And, like, and I think that's how a lot of people read his character, which is very strange to me because, to me, Perrin is, like at times, definitely the shittiest. Yeah, it's weird because, like, um, it's this thing where people's perceptions of the characters, like, the other characters' perceptions... Yeah. ...inform so much of what the writer is telling us the character is. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, you can't really fool us, though, because we're actually spending most of the time in the character's head. Yeah. It's just this weird thing. Like, everyone... Again, it's the same thing with kind of... uh, Rand and Matt, in a way, you get a lot of everyone being like, oh, um, oh God, I can't even think of a good example. But but just, like, people being like, Rand's so arrogant and such a jerk. And I'm like, yeah, I see how you, like, would come to that, and I, too, have come to that. But it's like, I've also been in Rand's head where, like, arrogance doesn't isn't, like, part of the equation in yeah. a weird way. And, like, with Matt, everyone's just like, oh, Matt never changes. Matt's super immature. And I'm like in Matt's head that's not the case at all yeah like Matt's the most probably mature of the characters yes 
in a very strange way. And yeah, yeah with Perrin, it's just like there's this disconnect that's unlike the other ones, I think, really unsatisfying to read about. Yeah, because like with Rand, like his arrogance is a lot of the times when he does arrogant things, like, he's talking about how it is performative. Because yeah. he's like, I'm in this role as the drag reborn, and I need to be authoritative. Which is, like, it's whole own other discussion. But, like, yeah, a lot of Rand's... Then when you read people being yeah. like, he's arrogant, oh, you're like, oh, cool, it's working. It's working, yeah. And with Matt, he's, like, doesn't really do anything to change anybody's perceptions of him. Yeah, he, he just, like, doesn't give a shit. Yeah, he doesn't care. And it's also, like, it behooves his ability to run away from things if people aren't expecting a lot from him. Yeah, Matt Matt sets up every situation to exploit it. Yeah. So when he when everyone's like, oh Matt's in like I think about in this book later on when he's like everybody thinks Matt like he's really obvious about his attempt to escape yeah. because he's like everyone thinks I'm dumb and they if they're like paying attention to me doing this dumb thing, they won't notice what I'm actually doing. <laughs> yeah. Which is <laughs> classic. Hilarious. Yeah. Matt, the king of manipulating yeah. everyone's underestimation of him. Yeah. So. Read Gaywin and Galad. Oh, I love that scene. I know, it's a great scene. Um, I can't wait to talk about it. I know. But yeah, it's just like, it's kind of depressing to just be like, everyone's like, oh, Perrin's such a stand-up guy. And then you get a Perrin's head and it's just like this turmoil of like weird tension and yeah. disturbing, like self-centered anxiety. Yeah. Perrin is a very self-centered character. It's just weird. Yeah. And I just, Yeah. He'll yeah. fail and become worse. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard. I used to really like Perrin, and now I'm kind of like... Me oh, too. Yeah. I'm coming to terms with the fact that I actually don't find many redeeming qualities about him. Me neither. I only like him when he's, like, I don't know, doing blacksmith stuff. I know. And occasionally when he's, like, interacting with other characters normally who aren't fail. Yes. Like when God. he's chatting with Gaul or Loyal or whatever. She's like, oh, great. Yeah. I don't know. One of those weird things. Yeah, in my first reread, I really liked Perrin. Yeah. In my first reread, my first read. But now that I'm rereading things, I'm like, Perrin is so annoying. Yeah. It's upsetting. Like, Rand is also annoying, but in a way that makes a little bit more sense to me. Yeah. With Perrin, it's just like... When Rand's written to be annoying, like, it's... Clear, like, there's some intention to yeah. it. Like, Rand is supposed to be this kind of exaggerated annoyance. Like, yeah. the way people perceive him and the way he perceives himself, it's all supposed to be tangled up in this, you know, tyrant dynamic thing. Yeah. Whereas Perrin's, like, you genuinely are like, oh, Robert Turner was trying to write this stand-up guy and just, like, kind of fucked it up. Yeah. Maybe, you know, got a little too into the nice guy trope. Perrin is, yeah, nice guy to him. Yeah. Where he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm a nice guy. Yeah, Perrin's like, I'm a good guy, just doing doing shit. And it's like, ugh, Perrin. I wish Gaul would kick him in the head. Ugh. Gaul could, too. I know, I love that scene where Gaul just, like, leaps into the air kicking. Oh my god. Gaul's such a... Such and imagine extra. doing that when you're seven foot, uh, six foot seven. I know. How do you even What's get off the ground? <laughs> it's kind of like a seven foot vertical leap. <laughs> yeah, he can leap as high as his own head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perrin's like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> He's like a cricket. <laughs> is like a cricket i just have it's like incredible you have so much limb and you're just so agile i know imagine he is like a cricket you're right (laughs) just a little little grasshopper a little jumpy boy (laughs) a big jumpy boy excuse me Um, lest we forget (laughs) then it jumps over to rand's point of view the first in the book and one of i think like five in the book total and you know it's like a page and a half and he's just like here I am, killing dark hounds. <laughs> yeah, bale firing dark hounds. He's like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I, I have no idea to... what I'm doing, and sometimes it doesn't work. And I'm like, what did you do when it didn't yeah, work? Yeah, exactly. Pray tell. Pray do tell. Did you just bale fire a tree? Yeah, because like we learned swiftly in the series that basically nothing works on dark hounds. Yeah, except, except bale, bale fire. fire. Yeah, so it's like, okay, how did you hold your own with these? Did you just nasties like, eat it? I know. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Where you like eat or be eaten, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, Rand's weird trek through. God, he's such like a weird character in these. Ugh. I know, and he's like, come on and hunt me. I can hunt too. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah, he says, like, I'm not a piece of meat. Yeah. Which is really weird, actually, because Matt says something similar. 
mm. later in this book, and I'm just like, what's up with these boys and interpreting themselves as pieces of meat? Yeah, slabs of meat. It's just like really weird. Yeah, everyone's got everyone's got a weird relationship with objectification in this series. All of our mains do. Yeah, makes sense. Which is interesting. Yeah, I am no, I am not meat. I am no meat. It's like no one said you were. <laughs> I was like, who? Maybe the dogs did. <laughs> okay, I guess. But they're dogs. Which is like, why? Why meat? Yeah. Why this? Why this particular metaphor? Anyway, yeah, it's like a couple chapters that kind of feel like they should mean more than they do, but since I've read parents, the rest, like it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't change his arc. Yeah. In any way, it just sort of like enforces his shitty behavior towards his own. Perrin's wolf arc is frustrating because it takes the entire length of the series. Yeah. And that's just, like, too long for any narrative arc, really. Mm -hmm. Unless it's as complicated as kind of Rand's. Yeah. Like, Rand has a complicated enough position in that, like, it's multifaceted. There's not just, like, the hero complex and the idea that you have to die to save the world. There's also the whole reincarnation thing and the madness thing. Like, there's a lot going on there. Three wives. Yeah. Like, he's just, like, got a lot going on. That can extend the length of the series as far as I'm concerned. But, like, Perrin's wolf thing doesn't really merit that type of in-depth analysis. At least not for readers who are familiar with this storyline already. Yeah. Like, we're not really breaking new ground here, Copernicus. Like, (laughs) it's Wolfman. Okay, we've been there. We've all seen Teen Wolf. You gotta embrace the wolf. Yeah. We all know it. Embrace your wolf, man. Embrace your inner wolf. Embrace your inner savage creature. Yeah, that's the monster story in general. Yeah, exactly. Man has to embrace and understand his darker side in order yeah. to be a fully actualized human being. So cetera, it's just like cetera. 14 books, really? We've really? all seen Dracula. Yeah, we've all been here. Anyway, that's why I'm 14 bored. books? I thought we at least got some new ground <sighs> earlier than that. Where are you? You're in book seven? I just finished book seven. I mean, he starts, like, getting more in tune with the wolves, but it's still just, like, an it's on and off issue angry about it. He's until got... book 13. Oh, that's very, very annoying. The book I'm on currently, he finally comes to terms with it. It's so annoying. What if we just deleted the whole bear lane thing yeah. and Perrin just dealt with more with the wolves and so he was less annoying. That's not what I want, though. I want him to deal less with, well, or I want I mean, him to like, deal more with the wolves in a productive yeah, way. Yeah, if he, like, dealt more with it earlier so that he got to a better place. I want the um, same levels of recruiting that Perrin accidentally does with humans to happen among the wolves. Yeah. Like, I'd like a few more wolves with actual personalities. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Not just Hopper, Dream Wolf, Ghost Wolf. I also want, you know, just some wolves who are, like, here, I'm your right hand, wolf. Here, I'm your right hand, wolf. What would your wolf, what would you name these wolf characters? I don't know, because they all have dumb wolf names in the, in Robert Jordan land that I feel like are kind of um, stepping on Native American. I was about to say the same Yeah, thing. exactly. So I named them, like, Bill. <laughs> this is Bill, and this is Stephanie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie the wolf is the wolf, um... <laughs> Is the wolf parallel to Gaul. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. So yeah, we're building a really good new fellowship. Larry the Trollic, Jeremy the White Cloak, and <laughs> Stephanie the Wolf. I don't know about Stephanie, you know? No, what's her deal? What's her story? What is her story? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what journey I'm going to send these three characters on. We'll follow it as we go. <laughs> Just kind of see, oh, maybe, maybe they should be there. And good for Larry. He picked up two companions this episode. <laughs> He's been so lonely for so long. Yeah. Sure. I mean, just just look. <laughs> yeah, Larry's at, Larry's been just chilling in the, you know, eponymous village at the beginning of the yeah. fantasy arc. And finally, Jeremy rolls in to burn something down. I also like that we're unintentionally filling out, like, a heist trope. Yeah. And that we have Larry, the good guy, who's, like, kind of at the center. And then Jeremy, the explosives expert. And yeah. then Stephanie, who I assume is the muscle. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> we'll get more. I'm sure. We need a femme fatale. Yeah, we need a femme fatale. We need a right hand person. We need a we need a Brad Pitt. Yeah. To George Clooney. Yeah, we need Larry's sidekick. <laughs> Larry's partner in crime. Slash love interest. Good for Larry. Because we all know George Clooney and Brad Pitt were in love in Those movies. movies would be a thousand percent better if Brad exactly. Pitt and George Clooney were like married. I know. Legit the last time we watched them, I feel like we talked about this at length. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because it tracks. It's so good. If, and if Julia Roberts was just like Brad Pitt's sister who yeah. just gets dragged into it and is like, your fucking husband. Ugh. You guys are the worst. I hate you guys. You're stupid criminal idiots. Stupid criminal gays. More gay criminals. The other day, what is the what exactly does Sandra Bullock say in Ocean's 8 when she's like looking in the mirror and she's like somewhere there's a little girl laying in bed <laughs> dreaming of being, being a master thief or something like that? You're doing this for her. You're doing this for her. <laughs> and she's in like a disgusting bathroom in Central Park. And that's such an iconic scene. <laughs> and then a lady walks out of the bathroom. And it's like, okay. That's a great scene. I know. That movie's really funny. Okay, well, uh, join us next time as we continue this heist, yeah. more or less. What are they going to steal? I don't know. We'll find there's out. There's so much to learn. Yeah, there's so much stuff to steal. Yeah. We're writing About the real series. Larry's three so far. We'll get more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Larry's, <laughs> Larry's two. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, no, gosh, Ocean's Eleven. Isn't Danny Ocean part of the Eleven? I can't do this. I can't count the characters in Ocean's Eleven right now. I'm going to lose okay, it. Okay, fine. Larry's two or three. <laughs> Larry's two and a half. Two and a half two Larry's. And a half Larry's. <laughs> I'm going to lose it. Oh, my God. Well, Larry's got so many spinoffs in the works. Oh, God, I love him. Pretty okay. Larry. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to us ramble about the most nonsensical bullshit. Yeah, this um, has been a very goofy episode. Yeah, we're sorry. It started out weird, just got weirder. Um, But we'll be back. Are you looking up your sign-off? Okay, yeah, I'm okay. ready. Okay. So, but we've got... Do we have any housekeeping? Do we have any housekeeping? Good question. No. Okay. Please follow us on the internet. That's the best way for us to be able to chat with you guys, which we love doing, so... Hit us up on the social medium platform. Social medium platform. <laughs> a medium platform. Because um, that's as high as we can reach. <laughs> I speak for yourself. That's true. Emily's very tall. I'm actually not that tall. You just seem very tall to me. I know, because the, it's the limb thing. Yeah. But I was with my friends the other night, and I'm shorter than all of them. Like You're all shorter my, than Janet? I think I'm shorter than Janet, like by about an inch. Dang. Oh, I have to show you that picture of us. It's yeah. hilarious. It's turning. Um, anyway, I'm shorter than all of them, and that's, like, very disconcerting for me, because I'm, like, constantly looking up at them, and I'm like, what? You're just used to my being My self-perception me. is yeah. that, well, all my friends have been short, except Caitlin. Oh, my beautiful ballerina. Yeah, Caitlin. So beautiful. I would die for Caitlin. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, please find us on the internet, uh, and rate, review, and subscribe if you are loving Everybody Hates Rand. Throw the love back at us. Oh, well, yeah. Like a spitball. What? <laughs> Not like that, please. Or like one of those sticky hands. Is that better? You know what I'm Like moderately, about? I guess. <laughs> Sign us off. Slap that sticky hand <laughs> all over that iTunes <laughs> review. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to read this because I think it's so funny. Okay, this sign off comes from Sarah. Thank you for being the first person to submit. <laughs> A new sign off. This seriously had me like in tears at work. So, um, last Thursday morning, I had really bad neck pain, so my course mate gave me a shoulder massage while we were in the sewing workroom. This backfired when she pressed out a knot in my spine, and it made me really faint, and I passed out on top of a pattern cutting table. <laughs> And then had to lie there for 40 minutes because the technician wouldn't let me get up in case I fainted again. My neck pain was gone, though. <laughs> Best massage I've ever had in my life. What the fuck? My favorite part of this story is that you had to lie there for 40 minutes. My favorite part was that specifically it was on a pattern table. <laughs> yeah. Pattern cutting table. I know, the details here are peak. Like, yeah, it's very good storytelling. Good just so you know. Right? Yeah. Plus. Character building. <laughs> yeah. Plot. Who's the course mate, the instructor. Yeah, exactly. Got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, there was, yeah, there's a plot resolution. Your neck pain was gone. <laughs> Great. Congratulations. <laughs> Have a good week, everyone, but especially the technician. <laughs>